Okay, so, um, hello. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, just life, right? <laughs> um, okay, I, my cough is almost gone. Uh, it's going to come back now and then, but um, you have to bear with me. Okay, so according to plans from, like, okay, hold on one second. Okay, so prior, you know, what I said last class, a um, couple of things. Um, uh, most important, uh, a couple of things. All right, so a midterm three, I canceled midterm three, I just gave everyone the full credit for it. Uh, you should see that in Beachport. I have not finished grading uh, midterm two yet. Um, I probably won't get a chance to do that until tonight, maybe. Like, I don't know. It's just, yeah, not going on right now. Um, <clears throat> but that'll show you where you are before the final. And um, if you might, if you weren't here last class, um, I did decide that you can do presentations on the final, but I'm going to narrow, I'm going to narrow the parameters for what you can do for presentations on the final. So, um, <clears throat> so you can do PowerPoint, you can do, um, you could do a short film if you could share the screen with us or you send me a YouTube link or something like that. Um, these things all should be 10 minutes or less. Um, but, uh, and I'll send out a guide for that. I'm also planning to send out a review for the final since um, uh, the la next two classes are our last two classes. And so I can spend next week actually going over the review sheet because it goes all the way back to Mark's. Uh, and then all of the suggestions for the final project, which you'll have another week to work on after next Wednesday. <clears throat> and the suggestions for the finals are there. So you'll have a chance to look over those. I'll send them to you before the weekend. You'll have a chance to look over those before Monday. We can discuss it. We can review things and stuff like that. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So uh, what I wanted to do today, I talked about this last class too, is like one of the lectures that I skipped was actually... Uh, about postmodernism. Uh, I mentioned a few bits and pieces of this when we're talking about Stuart Hall, when we're talking about post-structuralism. Uh, I talked a little bit about, <clears throat> I talked a little bit about um, some of the aspects of postmodernism that have become just normal, that have just become part of mainstream social theory. But uh, last class as I was talking, I, I decided that, yeah, I, I should go back and actually give you a, a condensed, this is a condensed version of this lecture, but I think it'll be helpful for picking through what Anzal Dua is doing, what Doreen Kondo is doing. Um, you got a little bit of Saeed from Kondo, but, and that is part of the postmodernist movement, but I thought I'd give, go back and give you a broader context here a little bit. So this is not the full hour and a half lecture about it, but it'll be some of the things and I, and it ends with identity theories. And so how it became, you know, how does it become mainstream for identity theories as well? So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm recording this right now. So just so you know, uh, I am recording this lecture. I should have said that before I started it. So this is being recorded. This is going to be part of the YouTube video. Um, and it's mostly going to be the slide. So I'm going to actually put the slides in this video, uh, before it gets posted. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to go back over here um, and let me share so I'm going to share my screen and this time hopefully it should share the right screen um, <clears throat> okay so I'm going to share this screen and then switch it to oops switch it back to PowerPoint is it here okay Okay, so can y'all see the PowerPoint slide? Can y'all, uh, I'm not sure which screen's being shared here. The screen that's being shared is the one that's uh, labeled, what is postmodernism? Oh, you do see it, okay, good. All right, so that's what I wanted. It's, I have two monitors and sometimes it's hard to tell which screen is, 
it says share screen on the other monitor. Okay, good. So that's the one I wanted. It's working. Um, I am going to okay display it. And so you you may be seeing the notes. <coughs> um, let's see. Uh oh. Okay. So now everything just went by. All right. There we go. Okay, so sharing the screen here. What is postmodernism? I've got the same on both screens, so now I'm sure what's being shown. All right, so this is a, like I said, this is a brief just overview of you know what's happening, <clears throat> a brief overview of what some of these things that we've done at the end of the semester are kind of referring to, and I think it's just general knowledge. You know, this is I don't always give this lecture in the identities class, but I do give it in Anthro 401, which is Foundation of Anthropology, which is kind of a history of kind of a history of anthropological theory. Um, <clears throat> and so this is, you know, as a sub label, I just put this together this morning from my notes. And so I took a few things out, but I think it should at least give you the main ideas of what people are referring to there. Um, something to keep in mind is that postmodernism as a movement is kind of dead, but there are aspects of it that have just become social theory and they've become parts of the arts. They've become parts of social sciences, the arts and the humanities. Um, they've just become, you know, like the whole thing about multiple perspectives and they're never being, there's never, there's rarely, <clears throat> there's never one singular truth. And so we need to investigate things from different perspectives and to put things in historical context and look at how, you know, this whole Foucault's ideas about epistemes, all these things have just become general knowledge now. And so the movement, no one would call themselves a postmodernist now, except as an insult. Um, I've been called a postmodernist because of these ideas that I talk about, write about and things. Um, but it's like no one, you know, one of the first, you know, it's kind of like Fight Club, right? Like one of the first rules of postmodernism is to never call yourself a postmodernist. They hate, they hate being called that. And uh, so anyway, but I, you know, it's not, the movement is kind of dead with those aspects of, of it that are still here. So what is postmodernism? So, you know, I actually put some pictures and some of this stuff. Um, <clears throat> And what is postmodernism? Well, I'll get to a definition in the next slide. You know, I put these couple of images here. Andy Warhol actually, you know, obviously is usually referred to as a postmodern artist, but it's not just about it's not just about being sarcastic or playful. It's not just about, you know, flying in the face of all the masters and all these things. It's not just about framing pop culture as things that are worthy of being art or something like that. And it's not about being lazy as some artists, you know, they, there is a, you know, classical, classically trained artists um, who hate postmodernism and, avant and some forms of avant-garde art, you know, the, they call it de-skilling. Like you don't have to be able to paint anymore to do this kind of art. It's not, and so they just think they're lazy. They're just like, oh, they're just remixing things. They're just, taking, I mean, I could do, hell, I could do that. I could take more a picture of Mel and Moreau and colorize it. Like, what's so hard about that? Um, so, you know, it's like there's a big reaction against it. And I can take that and I'll do it later. I'll relate it to what happened in anthropology because anthropology saw the same thing. Um, what's so hard about that kind of research? I could do that. And I don't even know anything about that place. And saying we need to get back to science, we need to get back to math and all this. So fundamentally, so there's gonna be every field that postmodern pop, postmodernism popped up, there was a fundamentalist reaction against it, right? And so they're, and they're equally strong current. So this is not like the world was taken over by postmodernism and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so a couple of examples, so Andy Warhol's, you know, pictures of her, his painting of Marilyn Monroe, the Sydney Opera House, you know, postmodern architecture. What does that mean? Like what, how is that postmodernist architecture? What kind of principles are at work there, right? So, um, okay, so we'll get into some of these things. Okay, so talking about postmodernism, first you have to talk about, um, you have to talk about modernism. What was modernism and why do we call it postmodernism? Um, I talked about this in class, modernism, um, Modernism is best thought of as a project, right? Uh, modernism was a project intertangled with the scientific revolution, right? Um, and a lot of the ideas that emerged in the 17 and 1800s about remaking the world in terms of rationality, productivity, and efficiency. That they, were, they, they had it as their goal to use this new tool they had discovered, science and the scientific method, to remake the human world. Re 
to in some ways remake the natural world, but to remake the spaces that humans live in, to make them as rational and as efficient as possible. Um, and so in that way, modern, and this is what Foucault's work was all based on, like basically he was criticizing that, saying that how violent that was and how, um, how inhumane, fundamentally inhumane modernism as a project was. And you've seen examples of it. Uh, nationalism was a modernist project, right? Um, it, it, it was a very modernist idea. Let's carve the world up in terms of the number of the different kinds of people that exist, right? Or the people who actually have claimed to a certain, um, the people who actually have claimed to a certain area or um, piece of property, right? So uh, territory. <clears throat> Okay, so modernism as a project, and you can see that in the picture here. This is a typical modernist. This looks like, I think this is probably Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, but um, and Brasilia as a city is probably the most modernist city because it was the most first city that was planned from the start as a modernist project. Um, places like Paris were conversions, like Paris was not a modern city, it was the first one that they tried to make modern by putting it on the grid, putting it on a series of circles and making it more rational. Um, but Brasilia is one um, and it had some of the issues that all modernist projects have. So, <clears throat> okay, so um, modernist architecture, you can see that this is, you know, it's, it's the tyranny of the straight line is a, a, it's one of the things about modernist architecture is all straight lines, the building's very phallic and high rises, you can pile, you can put more people there, they can live comfortably. Um, it can hold more people, very efficient. Um, but you know, some of the problems you can already, and even things that aren't straight lines usually follow natural curves, right? So everything is reducible to geometric shapes, right? So that's the modernist. So you can talk about modernist interior design, you can talk about modernist art, you can talk about, and we will later, uh, you can talk about modernist fashion, like things like that. Very simple, very clean lines, very simple, um, all about uh, very functionalist to put it in anthropological terms, very functional they serve a fun it serves a function, um, frills and superstition, you know, you remember the modernist project, right, was to get rid of religion and superstition. Um, frills, superstition, things like that are just things that get in the way, they don't serve a purpose, so why even have them, right? So um, what we're gonna find later when we talk about urban design and architecture is that people don't like living in it's very sterile like the reaction that humans who live in these spaces normally have is that it feels like a hospital it feels sterile um, there's nothing I don't feel attached to this place because it's too universalist there's nothing there's no local distinctiveness because modernism as a modernism as a design uh, project was it supposed to be internationalist, right? So let's get rid of these little national, these little local quirks. And so people hated that. You know, people hate that you don't, you know, make references to local history um, and things in the architecture. Like you can't. So it's very sterile. It's like the best word for it. Um, okay, so that's one thing. So modernism project. Um, and another thing to remember: post-structuralism is a reaction, reaction to structuralism. Um, we didn't do that in this class, structuralism, but um, I could rephrase that as these are old notes, these are older notes. Um, um, Foucault was a reaction to Marx, right? That, you know, so post structuralism, <clears throat> post structuralism, as you heard about through Foucault, was a reaction against the the ob objectivity of Marxism, right? You remember, so same thing I just said about arch architecture. Marxism as its social theory was internationalist. Forget local distinction, that's just divine, divine and conquer. Nationalism is just silly. Um, gender theory, we should have gender equality. That's a, you know, these things that postmodernists and later are gonna call meta-narratives. Um, so Marxism is full of meta-narratives, it's full of these big ideas about everything. So the revolution was supposed to be universal and international. Um, Marx's idea that if you can strip away ideology, everyone is the same beneath the surface, right? <clears throat> Everything is the same beneath the, beneath the surface if you strip those away. So Foucault rejected that, right? Um, that power comes from the top through a police state. Um, yeah, Foucault rejected that too. It's like, no, power is more pervasive than that. It's something we live in, right? So again, you have these things, these ideas that permeated the 19th and 20th centuries that were just kind of being questioned at this point. Uh, and so, um, and pro-structuralism, 
as you heard about from Foucault and from Said and from and, and through Iowa Ong's article, um, it's a precursor for postmodernism. In fact, most people would lump Foucault in as a postmodernist, and that's fine. You know, you know, no one really cares about the labels. Um, if I were teaching a whole class on postmodernism, you would have to do the first month would be about Foucault, like pretty much. So, um, okay. So, why post? Okay. Um, what do we mean by postmodernism? Does it mean after what came after modernism? And so that's what this slide is about. You know, this is the kind of stuff I'd be writing on the board. Um, so uh, I'm going to change the view. I think things are getting obscured here. Let's see, how can I do that? Okay, so I'll just make it a thumbnail here. Okay, so um why post is it a result of modernism is it the aftermath of modernism is it are we talking about the development of modernism into something else um is it the the rejection of modernism as a project saying that it didn't work let's get rid of it uh, um most views incorporate most views of what of what postmodernism was um, incorporate more than one of these senses, and in fact, modernism and postmodernism were contemporaries for the latter half of the the later half of the 20th century. This is not an evolution, but it's more like one of Foucault's epistemes. And so, modernism and postmodernism, uh, you know, modernism emerged first, but postmodernism became kind of a thing in the early 20th century, just little bits and pieces. So, I say that it's best to think of it as one of Foucault's epistemes, just because um of how it emerged it didn't really catch on for a while there were people who were kind of exploring some of these ideas like um you know some people fit both categories you know um as you'll see i'll talk about him later but uh pablo picasso some people consider him the first modern artist some people consider him the first postmodern artist it doesn't you know these categories don't really matter it's more about the ideas and so we can place people in different places and so if you remember from a piss team, it's just like a system of a way of knowing things um, and every time there's an, a dominant episteme, let's say modernism was the dominant episteme for most of the 20th century, there was also an undercurrent of suppressed voices that we later came to call postmodernism. And so the t when the time was right, postmodernism kind of became the hot thing, and that would be like the 1970s. So it took until about the 70s for these ideas, they don't just fall out of nowhere. The things that support those ideas, the material conditions of those ideas already existed and they don't really emerge and become dominant until the uh, late 20th century, so. Okay. Okay, so can we even have a postmodern history? Um, a little picture of Foucault there. <coughs> so shout out to Foucault. Um, we can talk about it, but you know, there really is no history of postmodernism. Again, it's one of those epistemes. It's just an idea that boiled and simmered for you know simmered for a while, and then it emerged, became dominant, and then kind of went away in the 19, late 90s, early 2000s. Kind of people kind of got over it, um, but the positive and most productive things about it kind of stuck around in social sciences. And so, rather than give you a history of postmodernism. Uh, which no one would dare try to do unless you're like John, John unless you're Leotard or someone like that. Um, so postmodernism in theory, it's better to talk about it as in, as in, well, let's just look at what happened about, what happened to postmodern, you know, how did it emerge in theory? How did it emerge in art, urban planning, and then anthropology, and then theories of identity. So I'll try to relate it back to the class. Uh, and keep this relatively, again, I don't, I never, I don't want to go over like 40 minutes on this. So, um, postmodernism in theory. Well, you've seen examples of this. Postmodernism in theory, I don't really have to go too far into it yet because you've seen examples of it. Post-structuralism um, through Foucault, like with Foucault, post-structuralism, that's, that's a version of postmodernism, that's an aspect of it. Cultural constructionism, all these theories about gender being performed, race being a social construction, sexuality, um, resulting from the interplay between nature and culture and and power plays among the dominant ethnicity in a particular you know these, these things that you've seen um all along i've been integrating postmodernist ideas and so again i didn't label them as postmodernists because no one would now they're just kind of where anthropology are at, is where anthropology is at this moment uh examples you've seen um doreen kondo edward saeed stuart hall gloria Anzaldúa. Uh, the film Middlesex is the film performing the border, 
the film no logo. You've all seen aspects of postmodernism here. I just didn't call it that. So uh, some of the bigger ideas that I'm going to talk about later, they shouldn't be unfamiliar to you because you've already been exposed to them. I just presented them as anthropology, right? So again, the postmodern movement is no more, but many aspects of it became mainstream, mainstream ideas in the humanities, social sciences, and the arts, right? So, okay. So let's start with art. Okay, again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you know, postmodernism and art. Um, little typo though. <laughs> it's going to be late 1800s. Um, so in the late 1800s, and there's a really famous article about this. It's called the role, the role of art in the age of mechanical reproductions by Walter Benjamin, and it looks like Walter Benjamin. But if you you know go to grad school and talk about these guys in class, you, I learned in grad school. I thought it was Benjamin, but it was Benjamin apparently. So Walter Benjamin wrote this article, this essay, in a, I think it was 1981, the role of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. And it kind of maps out this history about what happened, what happened to visual art after the invention of, uh, what happened to mechanical, ah, sorry, what happened to class to the visual arts after the invention of the, of the, the camera, right? So, um, and part of a very simplified version of his argument is that, modern photography into the authority of painting to reproduce reality. So before the camera, yeah, there was avant-garde stuff out there. And there's kind of, you know, there are a few examples here and there of abstract art and things. But for the most part, your, your value as a painter, your standing as a professional painter was about how you could recreate reality, right? And so it's not just for the most part, it was about photorealism, about, wow, look at that, you know, the Mona Lisa looks like, it almost looks like a photograph or something like that. Um, but then also other expressive elements. It wasn't just about who could make it look the most real because you could still express yourself and have a style. But once cameras came along, that kind of took, that took away the ability of painters to have to be the authority on re of recreating images for people to consume somewhere else in a different time in a different place to mass produce them um and in fact and in in the same essay benjamin gets into you know what happens you know another th effect of the invention of the camera is that it decreased uh it, it decreased the special the um, it decreased the uniqueness of original artworks. And so the Mona Lisa became worthless when you didn't have to travel to, you didn't have to, to really see the Mona Lisa before the age of photography. You had to go to Paris, you had to go to the Louvre, you had to go see it, right? Um, because no one, there were no photographs. Someone could repaint it and they could put it, they could put a repainting in a pamphlet or a book, but you, to see the real thing, you had to travel to get there. You didn't have the, the money to do that. You didn't have the time to do that. And so, and it's, it's a much more complicated now, but yeah, that's kind of basically what he was saying was that it, these things just became reproducible artifacts, right? Um, it became a commodity, like photography turned the natural landscape, turned the visual arts into like just marketable commodities. Um, um, and so they didn't have a, you know, painters didn't have, you know, they, they couldn't corner the market on realism anymore. And so um, realism started ending. And so what happened was that artists started to play with representation itself. So painters started to have to think about what else can we do that cameras can't do? I mean, cameras can't, you know, at that time, cameras can't photograph in 3D. They can't give you change over time. You know, a, a photograph can't show you evolution. A photograph can't illustrate motion. And so painters started to experiment with these things. And so they started, they began, you know, the turn of the 20th century, um, artists started to even to really think about the whole idea of representation. Like, what am I doing as an artist? How can I, how can I reproduce reality in a way that's true to human experience? How can I show other people's perspectives? How can I, you know, and so they started doing really interesting stuff. And so representation came to the fore, art and viewer merged. Like people started to think about the viewer and perspective. Um, view of the art changes with the viewer's perception. Um, the object changes with uh, perception. So Cezanne, Cezanne, the artist started looking at, you know, this famous graph with his different way of painting trees and how, you know, they just look at it it involves like the parallax effect where an object change actually changes when it's viewed from a different perspective and that you can't really understand something unless you see it from different angles, right? And so what we're getting at here, and so we're still just talking about art, but what you should be hearing is this idea that well, what is objectively real? Can we know 
the world around us separate from how we see the world. And so now there should be an inkling that kind of plants an acorn for cultural theory, right? That kind of plants this little acorn for cultural theory to start thinking about like this historical event. Okay, historians like to say this happened because this happened and then this happened. Well, are we sure that's the only story here? Um, they started to question nationalism. Some people didn't become popular to question nationalism yet, but okay, well, what about the, you know, what do the, what do the Native Americans think about Thanksgiving? You know, what do Latinx people think about the conquistadors? This is not something to be celebrated, um, even though they built stuff, like whatever, it's a complex story. Um, so in art, they're already kind of, art is, you know, I always said this, I learned this in grad school, but, you know, artists are always about 20 years ahead of social theory. Like, they're just, they don't have to write about, they do write about things, but they don't have to. They just do stuff, and they, they think about stuff, and they do things, and then social scientists and, the, and the, uh, the other humanities kind of catch up with them 20 years later. And so here's one of those cases. Artists were already thinking about representation way before anthropologists, ex except for people like Franz Boas, which I'll talk about him in a second here. But, um, so art and viewer merged. View of the art changes with the viewer's perception. The object changes with perception. So Cezanne did that. I'll show you one of his pictures in a little bit. Um, but so going back, you know, and so what else can I point out if I'm going to talk about postmodernism and art? Why now? Like why, you know, if you remember through Marx, um, we, you know, a materialist philosophy says that you can't even ask the question until the material conditions exist for you to come up with some kind of answer right so you know what was happening at the beginning of the 20th century to change people's perspectives so the camera is invented but there were other things going on like the world is becoming more global um transatlantic travel became a little bit easier and a little bit more accessible to middle class people still not accessible to poor unless they were forced to and they did move too they had their own ways of moving but um the world came a little bit smaller through time space compression um cities were becoming larger people were coming in more contact with different ways of being human uh with different food styles with uh ways of cooking ways of dressing People were hearing different languages in their daily lives more than they were before because cities were starting to be these hodgepodges of different cultures and different languages. Uh, people smelled different in different contexts, you know, all now and on and on. So relativity was kind of becoming, kind of boiling, kind of simmering beneath the surface. Um, so you had in other fields, so this is what happened with the visual arts, like realism kind of faded and kind of went to, to photography. So realism kind of went out of style and among painters. They started experimenting with representation. Chemistry and physics had a similar switch. Um, certain things, in, in, even in the sciences, people started, oh, wait, you know, maybe they're, you know, relativism kind of just became a way of thinking, kind of a way that we experience the world around us. So chemistry and physics, you know, this is when Heisenberg came up with the uncertainty principle, like does, you know, an electron does not exist in reality or an electron never exists in any particular space. It's a cloud. It's a probability cloud around the, um, around the nucleus of an atom. It's just kind of floating there. The only time it, it's really located anywhere is when we look at it, is when we measure it. So an electron can only be said to be in a place at the moment it's been captured and measured. Uh, other than that, it's just kind of generally there. We can't see them. So um, Heisenberg, you know, it's the same height. You know, that's why Walter White in Breaking Bad called himself Heisenberg because it's unknowable. It's cloudy. It's fuzzy, right? So, um, and it's from chemistry, right? So Einstein's general general theory of relativity. Not going to get into that, but basically this whole idea that there's no fixed point. There is no fixed point in the universe. There is no center of the universe. Um, Time is relative, right? It's relative to how fast you're going, but then how do you know how fast you're going? Well, you have to measure it against some other object. Well, that object's not still either. So everything in the universe is motion, there is no still point. So ultimate statement, you know, scientific proof that the universe, that relativity is an idea that can be applied to a lot of different areas. Uh, Picasso's cubism, which I'll do on the next slide, but before you get to that, so theory of relativity. Um, I'll note anthropologically, at the same time, you know, this is when Boaz was developing his theories about relativism, right? So there is no one way to be human. There is no best way to be human. There is no one 
superior mode of kinship. There was no, no one superior economic system. Humans have developed a range of ways to do these things. And, you know, this lays the foundation for cultural constructionism later. So without Boaz, you wouldn't have Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead. Uh, without Margaret Mead, you wouldn't have had modern feminism in some ways. Um, and I don't know how true that is, but uh, but these theories of cultural constructionism wouldn't have, you know, were starting to kind of percolate at the time too. So again, relativism just become this general thing and it included anthropology in that. Uh, Picasso, so again, you know, Picasso is a good illustrator of what, you know, so in some textbooks you'll see Picasso referred to as the first modernist artist. In some places you'll see him referred to as the first postmodernist artist, which was it? Doesn't matter. Um, he didn't use either one of those terms. So, um, and by, you know, a lot of the, the labels depends on how the author is defining these terms. So, uh, a lot of things that are labeled as modernists are actually postmodern. A lot of things that they called postmodernists actually really could be called modernist, right? So, um, but, you know, Picasso, Picasso's work, his cubist works, like uh, Mademoiselle de Avignon, which is what this, one of his first, well, I think this is his first really famous painting of prostitutes from Algiers in Paris, of uh, Algerian prostitutes on the streets of Paris, um, is what this is. And there's a lot of writing. You could, you know, you could search, you know, you could read for days about just the analyses of these paintings there's so there's been so many analyses of these paintings but i won't get into that um you know some of it is about how you know postmodern it it's some people label it postmodernist would call it that because it kind of it's a critique of modernism is embodied in this painting um because it kind of includes what it and repels at the same time so it's yeah, anyway, I, I, I don't want to get into that, but let me just stay with this, the plan here just to keep this short. Um, so one of the movements in modernism and postmodernist art, again, they kind of bleed into each other. There's no one or the other. There's no dividing line. Abstract simplification to geometric shapes and planes. Oops, sorry. Uh, to geometric shapes and planes. Um, you can kind of see that these women's bodies can be broken down into very simple geometric shapes. Um, there's something to be said there about how masculine they look, and that was kind of one of the points of it, was he was supposed to make them look repulsive. There are syphilis scars on them, you know, these different things. He's supposed to make them, one of the points of this painting was to make them gross but sexually attractive, and it was kind of like, almost like an embodiment of Orientalism, right? I'm fascinated with this thing, but it's gross and I'm repulsed by it. And it's kind of like this really, yeah, it's really, it's a really important painting in the history of art because it just has so many contradictory messages. So um, geometric shapes and planes, multiple and simultaneous viewpoints. So this is one of those ways of playing with uh, this is one of those plays, ways of playing with representation. You can see them from multiple perspectives. You've got interlocking movements. Ah, I keep asking. You've got interlocking movements um, of like, I'm not sure exactly what that refers to, but you've got these things where the um, they're blending in with the space. Uh, you have a synthesis of space and figure. Right, so they're they're part of the natural world as a way of also othering them, right? That they're part of the natural landscape to be devoured, consumed, and tossed away, like these different things. So you know, it, he's criticizing what's happening in Paris at the time, like in terms of racial politics and a lot of other things that are happening. So, um, but this is one of the things. So this is kind of it's almost you could consider it a borderline figure between modernist and postmodernist art. Um, so. Okay, so I'll move on. Cezanne, yeah, so another painting around the same time was playing with, this is what we mean by they're playing with representation. Um, began moving entirely away from realism, experimenting with the idea of representation itself. And so this is one of uh, Cezanne's tree paintings uh, where it's referencing a tree even in the space around it. And you can kind of make things out, but it's asking some work of you, the viewer, that it's almost a three-dimensional. If you really look at this painting, it's kind of three-dimensional, right? And so what they're trying to do is play with how, you know, it basically Suzanne, a lot of one of the one of the through lines in his work is how things change when you see them from different perspectives. And so he's trying to do that in the 2D space here. Um, okay, so that's art. So art, main thing about art, camera invented 
painting, you know, painters started experimenting with representation, doing other things. What else can I do? Uh, Suzanne and Picasso are two are two like examples of that. Um, so let's move on to urban planning and architecture. This actually could, I could call it architecture. I don't really get into urban planning in this version. So let's imagine it says postmodernism in architecture. So um, when people say when did postmodernism start in urban planning and in architecture, a lot of people will give you this date. Um, and I say it as a joke. I'm being a little sarcastic, but some people do still give that date july 15th 1972 and it's funny that you can actually name a date <coughs> and why that date well that's when this housing process pro project um, housing complex we call them projects now okay i don't know why so many people are outside of my garage okay like um um so um this is the housing complex this was um it was the ultimate modernist project. It was going to make human life more livable. This is in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, it was demolished. Uh, it was the last grand housing complex designed for low income families. And what the idea was among urban planners was going to be that they were going to make these rational buildings, these rational spaces for living that were going to solve all of our urban problems with homelessness and with poverty and with homelessness, poverty is going to increase, you know, it's going to improve race relations because it's going to give um, people of color affordable places to live because they've been damaged so much by blah, blah, blah. So all this stuff is, you know, this was built in the 1950s, I think. Um, it was a huge modernist project. Um, um, it was modernist, functionalist. It was internationalism. So there's nothing distinctively Midwestern or American or about St. Louis or anything about this. Like, it's free of you know it doesn't have any kind of romanticism there's nothing uh, yeah is there a question oh okay try to mute, mute yourself okay so I'm here in background but uh try to mute, mute yourself if you have it uh, um I got enough noise here I'm making noise myself I got in the background but uh okay so it was um but if you do have a question I can't see you right now oh am I glitching Okay. Okay, so Kevin asked the question. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, you can text me and I can open it. Uh, was this in part because they're anti-communist sentiment as for the cancellation of projects so that have a similar to Eastern block housing? Um, get into that. Like, I'm going to answer your question, not in the text, but there's probably some anti-communist sentiment because, yeah, that's part of the internationalism of modernism and the communists went full bore into it in the Soviet Union and China. Uh, I mean, this is still pretty much what Chinese cities look like. <laughs> um, um, it wasn't demolished out of anti-communist sentiment as much as it was demolished because it was an abject failure. Um, crime rate soared, right? Um, it became, you know, this project, what happened was as rational as you could plan a housing project like this, they didn't take into account the other issues that America had, right? They didn't, they didn't anticipate that these housing projects were just going to become dumping grounds. We're just going to become dumping grounds for poverty and for crime, right? Because crime just follows poverty. And then if you got crime, if you got poverty and then the crime that goes with it, and because we're talking about America, these spaces are going to be more black and Latino than anywhere else because this is after the age of this is after white flight. White people are all in the suburbs. This is where most of the poverty is congregated. It's a darker space in terms of skin tone. And so these things, it just fed into racism. And so they just became uncontrollable. So, and the reason people say that this is when postmodernism started is because this is when urban planners realized that this model for, for building cities was just not going to work. You can't just compartmentalize a city's problems um, because all it does is compound them. So you need to address them at the root um, and make these spaces more livable and maybe even try to make spaces that kind of mix the wealthy and the poor in the same areas. And people hate that. As wealthy people kind of hate that. But still, these cities are healthier in all ways when you can have some hetero heterogeneous neighborhoods, right? And so people are still trying to make that happen. And so, um, and so it was demolished. Like, um, this was one particular case, but this is what this was a big deal in the planning and architecture um, communities and circles, just because like, wow, this was such an ambitious project. 
but in around it, it was like, yeah, okay, this is not working. These places are filthy. They're and it's not the people's fault. Like, they're filthy. They're just ways of they're just well housing poverty. They they failed, and so this is a big deal. This is one of the things that helped postmodernism as a as an aesthetic kind of take flight in the 70s and 80s uh, because this was one of those moments like wow it's like all the stuff that we tried between 1940 and 1970 it just didn't work um the jetsons never became a reality right we just didn't get faster higher bigger more rational and everyone has a flying car and a robot servant you know stuff like that it's like yeah this is that was a very immature way of viewing what the future you know future is not you know, the future doesn't the future doesn't emerge in linear fashion and and they just weren't human they just weren't conducive to human life they weren't comfortable spaces for humans so people didn't really didn't want to live in sterile boxes they liked they actually liked local organic vernacular architecture so they had erased the vernacular people liked the frills right you know the world had been mostly frill and these organic communities um before so people like things that were organic local quirky even uh architects abandoned modernist universalism in firm, in flavor of, in favor of local organic configurations pastiche became a new style and so we've talked about pastiche uh in terms of identity it became so pastiche just refers to taking something from a different time and a different place and bringing it um taking something from a different time, a different historical period, and something from a different place, from a different country, from a different aesthetic, from a different tradition, and, and putting these things that is basically the stylistic version of remix, right? You all know what remix is because of music. Well, pastiche, and in terms of style, pastiche is the remix, is the term for remix when it comes to fashion or art or um, architecture even. And so it kind of became the dominant aesthetic in the 1980s, right? And so they were like, okay, let's go back to some, let's borrow from things. Um, it doesn't mean we have to make buildings look old. So this is not romanticism. Romanticism would be like, okay, I'm gonna make this look like a 17th century French chateau or something like that. Okay, that's not postmodernism because you're leaving it whole, you're not borrowing. But the postmodern thing to do would be, let's take, the way, I like the way ceilings look in these French chateaus and I'm gonna put them in my modernist skyscraper that has some of these Japanese elements on the outside, right? So it's just basically just remixing things, um, creating a new vernacular, right? And so sometimes these things become so, um, they, be, they take on new meaning. Uh, where, I'm gonna go back here to, oh, yeah, okay. All right, I was gonna show the Sydney Opera House again, it's too far back, I'm gonna just forget it for now. Uh, and so, uh, the abandonment of meta narratives, and so, in theory, postmodernism. So in the late seventies, early eighties, these new ideas start to emerge in academia, in architecture, in urban planning. One of them, and one of the key ideas in postmodernism as a movement, was the death of meta narratives, the abandonment of meta narratives, even Marxism, like these universal big stories of everybody, of everything that ties everything together. Um, history, anthropology, theory became more focused on local and global connections, right? So you can't explain any one thing by some grand and global story. Like, um, oh, I'm gonna, ex I'm gonna explain the rise of tight genes in terms of the evolu human evolution toward having fewer children. And so that's why we, postmodernists, I mean, there might, I just made that up by the way, but, um, you know, postmodernists, just you know like started like, like we don't need these things because these stories like marxism foucault proved with marxism that it, it's not going to work because it's just it's a modernist fairy it's based on too much too many aspects of that modernist fairy it's fairy tale like the the enlightenment subject right this idea that every all humans are the same uh and that if you can take away ideology they're going to react the same way to being exploited exploited so um Structuralism was one, humanism. I mean, some people abandon humanism. Like, what do you mean? There is no universal human. Like what, let's just liberate people in their own terms. Uh, so feminism, I don't know, feminism, feminism. Uh, I typed this really fast, but uh, so um, not the abandonment of fem feminism, but this idea that there's a universal feminine, there's a universal woman out there that needs to be liberated, uh, which actually borrowed a lot from Marxism. So, um, this is what third wave feminists did 
and rejecting first and second wave feminism. It's like, hey, whoa, yo, slow down. Middle class white women in America and Europe don't speak for everybody. Our lives are different. Solidarity, but include my voice too. Like, and let's all have a bigger dialogue, right? Like not all women are the same. We don't all deal with the same issues in the same way. You don't speak for me. So by saying abandonment of feminism, I just mean a very exclusive and restrictive kind of feminism. You saw a third way, you saw a version of third wave feminism with Anza Abdul. That's third wave, third wave feminism. It's very local, it's very specific. It's down for the cause of women everywhere, but she's saying you're gonna hear my voice too, right? And that uh, you can I you might identify with pieces of this, you might not. Uh, I'm queer. I'm a lesbian. You might not be, but you know we can. Uh, I'm going to tell you my story in, in hopes that it might help you, right? So it's not so it's just abandoning of all of these things that are just universalism. And universalism was one of the biggest keystones of modernism. And so it's a big deal to reject uh, universalism. And so if you reject universalism, you're rejecting modernism because you're saying that science is not going to save us all in the same way, right? So. And we've talked about the age of post-Fordism, flexible accumulation. So again, that also, you know, I said in that lecture that that started in the 70s um, in neoliberalism. So we already talked about that. I'll maybe backtrack. Okay, so postmodernism in architecture, pastiche became the dominant logic. And this is one of the most famous examples. Um, ironically enough, it's right across the street from the Trump Tower uh, in Manhattan. This is the AT&T building. Um, why is it considered postmodernist architecture? Well, it's pastiche. Look, you've got modernism at the bottom, and you've got this clock top at the bar at the top. It doesn't seem to really make any sense, but it just kind of fits. And then it becomes part of the Manhattan skyline, and it takes on local distinctiveness. So it's an art project, right? It's pastiche, taking something from somewhere else. This is more of a medieval kind of look and combining it with the functionality of the modern. This is a very subtle postmodern art. There's some other things out there that could be considered a little more crazy. But um, so again, pastiche is taking something from another time and place or out of context historically and culturally and recombining them to signify something completely unrelated. It's playful. Uh, it can get you into cultural appropriation sometimes, which is where, you know, some people get into trouble, like appropriating the cultures of other people. Uh, but in terms of architecture, you know, it creates a new vernacular. Like history just gets flattened out. Like um, symbols, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but, you know, history is just a collection of symbols among other symbols. Um, so how does this relate to identity theory? Again, I can have other other examples of that, but I'm just going to move on here. Uh, displacement, displacement of the Enlightenment subject. Um, we saw that with Foucault in his transition from Marx. Uh, crises and representation led to an emphasis on surface appearances rather than depth and meaning. So if there's no ultimate truth, then we need to stop digging or at least dig multiple holes, right? There's no bottom to get to here. So let's just talk about the ones that are relevant to this issue that I'm trying to address. And so, um, and Kondo showed you with uh, with the M Butterfly article, like all knowledge is position and laden with power. So what we know as man and woman are just these, these constructed truths that have been produced through power, right? And they can be changed, they can be altered, they can be resisted, right? They can be reinterpreted, they can be, so, and all of this stuff takes place on the bottom, on the, the, the body. Uh, all of this stuff takes place at the site of the body. So the body is where these battles take place, right? Um, it's where power is secured, but it's also where resistance happens. And so we saw that with Foucault. Um, so crises and representation led to things, the simulacrum, this idea, a lot of people, oops, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, and this is referenced a lot in the film, The Matrix, um, this idea that reality and the representation of reality have just completely merged. So we've gone beyond 2D paintings that try to include the viewer in the artwork to a state where we don't even know what the real reality is. And I think postmodernists would be the ones who died, who were really active and writing in the 1980s, they would love to see social media because it kind of is like, what's, re what's reality? Um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or the actual world out there. I see it all the time. I'm on Twitter a lot, so I see it a lot. Um, when people are making these projections for elections, I mean, if you looked at just Twitter, like you would see one view, wow, the world, the country loves this person. 
and then you know people have to remind that Twitter and Instagram and Facebook are not the whole world. There's a lot more people that vote that don't use those platforms. So it's really hard to know what's the real world and what's an image, you know. Um, so simulator, you know, the way people toss around the term fake news now, like you can just do that to shut anybody up on social media. Um, and people get into arguments and both sides of the arguments, like one side, well, hey, I got this from here. They just, they have references and they're out there. And unless you have the time to really vet each reference that they give you for its validity and its, um, and its value as a source of information, you don't have time to do that. And so in the end, you just get exhausted and you just quit and just go like, I don't, I don't know who's right. I don't know which references are legitimate. So I'm just going to bail, <laughs> whatever. And so it is horrible. It's like terrible for the world pretty much. Anyway, so the simulation was this idea that we were going to get sucked into VR and not even know it. Um, uh, artists kind of played with this a lot. You see a reference in the Matrix movies because that's kind of the area that they're talking about. History as image and commodity. Uh, I talked about the swastikas, the Nazi swastikas that became fashion objects in a lot of places in East Asia. They don't have any reference for it. I mean, they would be offended if an American showed up with Japanese regalia from World War II, right? That would be the same impact. So to them, the Nazi swastika was just, and there was a Korean, one of the girl Korean pop bands performed in Nazi performed in Nazi in Nazi military uniforms and they really didn't see the big deal about it. Calls and outrage. They never did it again. They apologized eventually. But it's the way like history is just a collection of images, especially in the age of Google, right? You can pull up any image and make any kind of narrative. You can remix your own history and you won't get very far, but think about how many teachers can remix their own history and they grant awards and degrees and things like that. So um School districts are doing it. History is being rewritten in Texas. Um, you probably heard about this, but you know, if you write a text, a high school textbook, you basically need to play to the Texas uh, school market because they have more public schools and more students than anyone. And if your textbook can't sell in Texas, then a pub no publisher is going to publish it. And so, and then the Texas le legislature has been just harassing textbook publishers to try to change the narratives around slavery, right? To say that that uh, the Civil War is about states' rights. It was only, it was only marginally about slavery. Um, Africans who came here and were enslaved here, you know, their descendants often say that they appreciate being brought to a modern country and that they would have been worse off if they, you know, so they're trying to just rewrite this thing. So think about all the students in Texas, um, not to mention what they say about abortion and all these other things, but for the sake of the market, historians will change what they say about certain histories because otherwise they books, their books wouldn't be published. And a lot of it has to do with Texas politicians. And so again, knowledge and power, you can never separate knowledge and powers. What counts as, what counts as knowledge is usually been filtered through multiple layers of power. And so I hope that 200 years from now when US history is being taught, they're not, have, they won't have totally separated the Civil War from slavery because that's kind of what some people are trying to do right now, right? So, um, okay, so, and again, it's just an image, it's a commodity like other commodities. Right, so it's for, for to be bought and sell. So mistrust in all meta narratives. I just talked about that before. Deconstructionism, trying to excavate the histories between between I, behind ideas that we thought were natural, like gender, race, and things like that. Uh, it's more than that, but um, trying to pull out and illustrate how these things were shaped in power. Uh, that became a big thing in the eighties. Not so big now, but people like Derrida, if you've ever heard of them. Uh, was big on deconstructionism. So, um, and again, I will distribute that excerpt from that um, from that graphic novel about postmodernism. I will do. I think it'll help you understand some of this too. Uh, information itself became a commodity. You've heard the term, like the information age. One of his ideas uh, when he came up with that term, I forget the guy's name right now, but uh, information was just rather than use value. Uh, information itself would just become a commodity. It would have exchange value. Um, Facebook sells your data, right? Facebook, you know, Facebook doesn't give a shit who you are. 
but they take who you are online in digital packets and sell it to people who can use it, right? So Martin Zuckerberg couldn't care less what you had for dinner, but showing them every night what you have for dinner says a lot about your taste and what you'll buy, right? And they take that and they sell it. So information has exchange value more than use value. And that's a very blunt, that's a very clumsy example but yeah in some ways you know universities have been rearranged so that not we don't want you college students to be knowers of things we want you to be workers we want you to be employable people and you want to be employable right so that's you know we see the decline of majors like philosophy and in some ways anthropology and art history um as the world changes, those degrees are just becoming, you have to feed yourself. I mean, it's, you know, uh, so yeah, it's kind of a sad thing, but yeah, the world is kind of changing to where information itself is just being known for what, less than what it can, do, what you can do with it, but more about what can you, how can you use it to make money basically? Um, and it's kind of sad. Okay, so postmodernism, bring it back to identity theory and try to wrap this up here. Fundamentalism is a reaction against it. It's also part of the movement. And Stuart Hall even said, relativism and fundamentalism might indeed be the complicit twins of postmodernity. Um, relativism, we, yay, there's diversity. I can borrow from different things. And then fundamentalism, oh my God, this is changing too much. Make, fill in the blank, great again. Right, fundamentalism is just as much a part of this age as relativism is, right? And it always has been. Some people don't like change. They don't like, they don't like adjusting to new ideas. They don't like adjusting. So what they do, and again, this is where this idea of the simulacrum, simulacrum comes in again. When they say, make America great again, or when they say, let's go back to the old Italy, when they say these things like that, they're just looking at picture books. They're looking at images. They don't know what it's like. Most of them aren't old enough to remember what it was like in the 1950s, right? Um, so they're looking at I Love Lucy. What is I Love Lucy? That's an image. That was a piece of propaganda to convince women to not work outside the home, right? So, um, I mean, hell, I could look at in the 1990s, I was, you could look at it, I don't know, y'all are probably not old enough to remember married with children, but you could write a paper about, about fundamentalism and Al Bundy, you know, like he talked, you know, he, was, he always talked about like Dwight D. Eisenhower, like a parody of, you know, that's when the last great pre president, right? Uh, anyway, I don't know if you're old enough, you can enjoy that. If not, you have no idea what I was just talking about, but um <laughs> so fundamentalism has always been a part of it. Uh, what happened in anthropology? Anthropology turned away from seeing objective universal truth and instead developed an emphasis on sign, signification, and representation, just like in art, right? How do things mean what they mean? Uh, some people will even say anthropology since about 1985 has been too focused on language, right? Um, been too focused on the way that language, you know, the way that meaning is constructed in a relativist fashion through language. And so you, most of you probably have linguistic anthropology classes. Uh, I wouldn't say it's an over emphasis, but yeah, in theory, cultural theory in general started to rely a lot more on language. And that's what happens when you let go of the idea of universal truth. Uh, you look at how truth is made, right? So, and so all forms of knowledge are produced through the operation of power. Again, so looking at language, looking at power, um, knowledge, um, knowledge and power inseparable. That was Foucault's, one of his big impacts on academia. Uh, meaning is creating in the fields of sign, not in direct relationship between language, meta languages and reality. So meaning is produced in a relationship between a network of signifiers. And if I were drawn on the board, I'd illustrate this, but I'm gonna, I'm getting too long now. I think I'm getting about an hour. So um, signifiers are easily adjusted and shifted and contested in practice. So in some ways, you know, again, this is that idea of the simulacrum we live in a world of signs and as humans, we've increasingly become that, right? And so in some ways it's depressing because it's really difficult to experience the real world. Although with the COVID-19 situation, we're being reminded that the, you know, nature matters and nature doesn't give a shit about what humanity is planning to do, right? That um, natural disasters have like this can have a way of reminding you of that. But, you know, it's sad that human cultures and signification is happening in a world of signs, but at the same time, it also makes them more resistible, right? So if all of this is caught up in language games, then, you know, if all of this is caught up in language games, then we can contest that. And so I'm gonna do here, um, 
I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to come back. So you can go back. I will post that to Beachboard and you can get a sense. You know, you can stop on some of the slides and read the notes, uh, compare it with the, um, you can compare it with the excerpt I'm going to post. I will post that at the same time I do the video. So I'm recording this and this is what, I think this is a better way than the way I was doing it before. Um, Camtasia just makes these humongous videos. So hopefully I can just put this straight to Beachboard and I'll post that excerpt from what is postmodernism, that comic book. So um, it's, it's really helpful and it's only about 12 pages. Um, so, all right, so I'm gonna log off here. I'm gonna stop here, I'm gonna stop recording. Uh, unless anyone has a question. Okay, um, I'm still, you know, again, stuck with a lot of stuff right now. I will try my best to grade them. Just hang in there. I'll email you. I'll send you an email when I've graded those, unless you get it. I think you'll get an alert when I graded those midterms too. So midterm two. So I'll get those graded, and then it'll just be the final. And then we'll spend both classes next week just preparing for the final paper. There's no final exam. It's just the final paper, and that's your last 25 percent. So. Uh, you should have an idea of what I'm looking for by the end of next week. So I'll see y'all then. Sorry about all the glitching and like, uh, when is that due? Uh, which, when is what due is, um, the final paper, the final paper, um, the final paper is going to be due at the, usually I make it due whenever, um, I don't have an answer yet, but I can look it up. Like, hold on. Right. If you don't mind sticking around for another. Okay, why is this doing that? Okay. Um, if you don't mind sticking around for a little bit. Okay, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, am I? Okay, so uh, let me, I can tell you exactly. Because I don't think I put that on the syllabus, but if you look at your exam schedule, it'll tell you when your exam for this class is. Um, okay. I guess I'm doing it here, just mirroring. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, there's my exam. Okay, 419. Okay, so May 11th. Okay, so it'll be due, let's say May 11th at 5 p.m. I'll just say that. So uh, final due May 11th at at 5 p.m. Um, and if anyone presentations will have to be during class period time, I can't make you do some other time, but presentations um, for that will be 10 15 to 12 15. And uh, will be 10 15 to 12 15. Okay, presentation will be tuned on May 11th, and that's um, so on May 11th. So I'll know by the end of next week who's doing a presentation and who's just going to turn in a paper to Dropbox. But if you're doing a presentation, then we'll just get together here on Zoom, get as many people here as we can from the class, and then you can just give it here. You can I'll make it so that you can share your screen, and you can just talk and tell us about it. You can do it as if we were in the class. So um, if you're thinking about doing that, just let me know. And I'll send you, like I said, by the end of this week, you will get the um, review packet and it'll have instructions for the final. So, cool. all right, any other questions? Okay, all right, so I'll see y'all Monday. You'll be hearing from me over Beachboard for the grades and then also for the review packet. So have a good weekend. I know it's just Wednesday. It's kind of weird to sit on Wednesday, but I won't see most of you till next week. So, all right, have a good weekend. Take care, stay safe. Um, don't join any protests like we it's not time yet hang in there um, I went to the beach uh, my family we went to the beach last night in uh, Seal Beach and they said it was closed but late at night but there were like four people there it was awesome they were, we weren't going to get out if it was crowded but so that's something you can do uh, if you're close to the coastline seems like nighttime beaches get kind of empty so it's good to you know, it's good to get some fresh air. So try it. So if you can do that, or just go for a walk in your neighborhood and do stuff like that. I'm sure you are. So um, if you need anything, let me know. Send me an email. Uh, so, all right. See y'all later. Bye.